Okay. Hi, my name is Ryan McElroy. Um, I'm an engineer here at Facebook. I work on the Memcache team, and I'm here to tell you about one of the systems we've built to help us scale Memcache and Tau called McRouter. Primarily in this talk, I'll be talking about the Memcache use cases. So, first a note. At Facebook, we don't use the terms Memcached and Memcache interchangeably. Memcached very specifically refers to the caching server um, that probably most of you have heard of and maybe many of you have used. Who has used Memcached? All right, so when we say Memcache, we're talking about the entire system. That includes the client and the server. There's a bunch of client-side logic to make Memcache work in a distributed way. So, a little introduction to Memcached for those who aren't really familiar with it is a network attached hash map. It's very simple and very fast. Um, basically, it doesn't know anything about the outside world. It only accepts requests and responds to them. It never sends anything out on its own accord. Um, this makes it so it's essentially the simplest thing you can think of. Um, but it, because of that, it can be very fast. So all of the main operations it supports are like any, any hash map. It supports get, set, delete a few other things that um, make it useful. There's a few ways that we use Memcache here at Facebook. I'll talk about the three primary ones. The one that we encourage most people to use is, is um, as a demand-filled look-aside cache. This is what I call the standard model of Memcache. It's because it works really well, it's proven at scale, and it deals with the, any consistency issues that can come up. So in this model, as you can see, the client will send a get to Memcache, and either the result will come back, in which case the client is good to go, that's the normal case, or we'll get a miss back. And in the case of a miss, the client has to do something. So in that case, if there's a miss, the client will send a query to a backing store. That backing store might be a database, it might be an RPC server, like a thrift server. Really, it can be any arbitrary client logic. Here at Facebook, we see all sorts of things. We see curls going out, we see large computations happen. Anything you can think of can actually happen here. Once the result is calculated, we can then set that, the client will get the result back and then the client is responsible for setting that result back to Memcache. Now, note that that set is not for the sake of the client that's currently running. It's for any future client that might come along that wants to, that wants to access that data as well. The client that we're talking about already has the data from the backing store. We also see Memcache used as a non-durable store where the data that is set to it could disappear any time and the users are okay with that. I'll get into some examples of, where, of why this might be useful later. We also see it used sort of as a fast publish store. In this use case, there's a publisher, which is not the client, that is continuously setting data from some stream into Memcache, sometimes a replicated set of Memcache boxes in case there's a failure. And then the client will be reading that data out, and it will always be fast and uniform low latency. So you may have heard about Tau, like in Harrison's talk, and wonder, well, Facebook is a social network, so why isn't all of your data stored in Tau, right? And what it comes down to is that not every piece of data easily fits the graph model. And so in practice, even though a lot of our new stuff is built on top of the Tau model and it works very well, the read through and write through semantics give us a lot of power to optimize and so on, the key value semantics of Memcache are so easy to understand and so easy to use, and Memcache is so general purpose that we see a lot of people still use Memcache for these things that don't fit that other model. And in practice, we've found that Memcache and Tau have had about equal usage over time. That surprised me personally. So you'll see up here some examples of ways that, that uh, Memcache gets used, and I'll cover a few of them next. So one way that we see memcache being used is to cache results of expensive RPC calls. So you can imagine something along the lines of um, we have down here a timeline aggregation that's going on. Um, so Harrison covered this very briefly in his talk, but you can imagine that these, this here is actually a, a map of the, of the recent bike rides I've done. And in order to calculate that, we had to do a large range scan over a period of time. I think this goes from March to July, so that's a number of months that we had to read of, my, of data out of my timeline to build this. So that was an expensive thing to build up. A timeline aggregator read a bunch of data out of a MySQL database, put this all together, but we don't want to do that every time somebody visits my, my timeline to, to see what bike rides I've been up to recently, right? So what we do is pretty simple. We'll store that in memcache. Um, there's several, there's several ways that, that this can be invalidated. One is if we actually have a replication stream, we can follow that to, to do the invalidations. 
but we can also use TTL if, uh, if we know that the data will be good enough to use for the next five minutes or the next day. We can set that TTL and memcache will expire it after some time. Another way that we see it used is to, as a query cache for expensive tower DB calls. Um, so an example I'll give up here is that little birthday cake you see when it's somebody's birthday. That's actually a fairly expensive thing to calculate on the fly. For me, we'd have to go and look at all of my friends, get their birthdays, and find out which ones are today. That's a really wide fan out query. And it's just for this little birthday cake. So what do we do? We actually only perform that particular query once per day for each user when they log on to the site. So it's relatively expensive then, but then we can store that in memcache for the rest of the day. So you can think of it sort of as a materialized index of some, some type of data that's particularly expensive to, to fetch, but we want to show it in many, many different places, so it's going to be used a lot. Um, for the, the type of head data, when you start typing into that search box before you actually hit any search page, that's also one that, that uh, requires a large fan of data. If you want to calculate that on the fly, you have to go and get my list of all my friends, all the pages I may have liked, a bunch of other things that I may be connected to somehow. So this is another thing that we'll use memcache for to make that much faster and much, much uh, uh, quick, quick, quicker to calculate. Um, there's a few other examples that I won't get into right now. Um, we also see memcache used as a write-heavy, non-durable store. So this is one of the uh, models I was talking about before. And so you might wonder, like, why in the world would would anyone like be willing to put something in memcache and then not know if they're going to be able to get it back when there's no other place to store it? And really, there's the the use case that I that I um, will talk about here is uh, the recent newsfeed results. So it, uh, a call out to our newsfeed servers can actually be pretty expensive. Um, you have to go and look over a, maybe a long period of time to see what the most interesting stories are to, to bring up to the top. But oftentimes, people will see their newsfeed. They'll click through to something. They'll come back to their newsfeed. Maybe they'll reload, reload the page. They'll view it on their phone. And lots, of, lots of these things will come together. So an example. Uh, a, we don't actually need to recalculate the entire thing all the time. If somebody's going to view almost all the same results, but just five minutes later, we can cache the results of the previous call and only do sort of a much smaller call saying, give me new news feed things from the last five minutes. And that can be um, a much quicker experience for, for users. So again, it's not required for correct operation, but it, it makes the experience much faster for users. All right. So Traditionally at Facebook, memcache has been for PHP only. And when I say memcache, once again, I'm saying memcache without the D. Anybody that had a client library could use memcache D, obviously. But when we built out this distributed system that had a bunch of nice features, that was primarily just written for PHP. So it was not accessible for many other languages. If you were using C++ or Java or Python, you're just kind of second class citizen. You, you didn't have all access to all the features that had been built and that were really nice for everyone else. So, the key insight that we have here is that everybody that wants to cache things pretty much already knows how to speak the memcache protocol. It's very widely used. So what we want is a service that you can talk to like it's just a single memcache D box, but the server will never fail, the, the, the network will never flap up and down, it'll have limitless memory, infinite read throughput. This is the mythical unicorn here, right? But what we have is clients that just know how to talk to memcache D. So what do we do? Well, we put in McRouter. So to a client, it looks just like a normal memcache box. It implements the widely understood memcache ASCII protocol. And to memcached, it just looks like another client. It sends the same queries that it would normally get. So you're probably looking at this and saying, OK, what's the big deal, right? So what's actually going on is McRouter has, can talk to a bunch of memcache boxes in the background. So together, it operates as a robust distributed system. Um, it's geo-distributed for low latency. It uh, has replicas to scale reads. It has access to terabytes of memory across many different instances, and it implements failover. So let's go into some of the problems that we face here at Facebook, and probably many of you have also run into using memcache and the solutions that MakeRouter has for them. So first of all, there's a really good paper that we wrote on this that we released this year. Um, it was in NSDI. It's worth reading. It has lots of cool diagrams that look like this and tell you a lot more detail about what's going on and some other things that I'm not even going to cover here. So if you want to know more detail about how we've been scaling memcache, I suggest you go read this paper. It tells a story about how we went from just a few instances of memcached to thousands of instances across dozens of clusters in several regions. So 
Going from memcached D to memcached is not just a backspace, unfortunately. Um, as the system scales, we encounter many issues, growing working sets, high read rates, heterogeneous workloads, the list goes on and on. So let's talk about some of these. So when we have a growing working set, there's a pretty standard solution, or there's a pretty standard problem. The active data doesn't fit into your one memcached D box anymore. You've gotten to the largest AWS instance or the most memory you can buy for your system. So what do you do? Very standard, you shard the data across more memcached D boxes, right? Almost every client library that I know of for, for memcache has, has this functionality built in today. So does McRouter. It uses a consistent hash. Um, so that way you can expand or shrink the pool in the fewest number of key switch places. If you lose one of your boxes, you bring a new one into that place and no key switch places, that kind of thing. Pretty standard solution. Works really well. Another thing that happens is really high read rates. So generally, the, the, the problem here is that one, one memcached D box can't handle the read rates. Uh, maybe you're in AWS and you can only do 50,000 packets per second, or maybe uh, you have your own data centers, but you're still maxing out some part of, like the, your network card or some other part of your infrastructure, right? Generally, only a small set of data is that popular. Um, and in our experience as well, the main limitation on the box is packets per second. And so splitting across shards doesn't actually increase the throughput. In this diagram, I'm showing that 10 keys are being sent to each of these boxes, and it takes one packet to send those 10 key requests to that box. But if you double the number of shards, you have to send five key requests on average to each box, but you still have to send one packet to them. So you haven't eliminated the number of packets you have to send per request, and so sending, or setting up more shards doesn't help you scale your read throughput at all. So the solution here is that we replicate the data. So McRouter knows about the concept of, of replicating data, and what it can do is it can have multiple replicas of the data and choose to read only from one of the replicas. And so in this case, if you have these four replicas and you choose only to read from a replica B, you can send all 60 keys to it in one packet, and you suddenly have a much higher throughput than you would with a sharded system. So heterogeneous workloads. Uh, the problem is that keys can compete for memory space, right? So the LRU inside of memcached is not aware of how expensive a miss will be on a particular item. So if you have a bunch of you know, complex things to calculate and a bunch of easy things to calculate, the more frequently requested inexpensive things to calculate can push out the expensive things. And then you're stuck recalculating the expensive thing, maybe less often, but it's still a, uh, not the optimal use of the cache. You'd like to be able to cache certain things longer or have them have higher precedence. So the way we solve this is we divide the, the workload into different what we call pools. The way we do this is we just simply look at the prefix of the key. We use three characters here at Facebook. And we divide them into different pools. So for example, let's say that the foo prefix is holding the complex data, and the bar prefix is holding particularly easy data to calculate. And then if there's no, if there's no match, we'll send it to a wildcard pool. What we can do is we can give the foo uh, pool a lot more boxes, give it a lot more shards, for example. Um, and that will allow us to, to make sure that, that foo keys are not um, evicted by bar keys, which are, which are much easier to calculate. All right, so of course we can compose these kinds of ideas, right? So we can have pools, some of which can be replicated and some of which can be sharded, and they can coexist in the same, in the same um, setup. And so we may be we may be sending some things over here with, that are prefixed with foo because we know they need to be replicated and other things that have a different prefix because it's okay if they're sharded. So failures. As we all know, in a distributed system, something is always broken, right? There's always a network that's down, some link you can't talk from A to B, or some box blows up, and, and so on. And we all know that clients are a lot simpler if they don't have to think about failures. If failures can happen but they don't have to worry about them, um, and the right thing just happens, then your client logic can be really simple. So, again, the problem is networks and servers fail. The solution is to fail over request. It's pretty straightforward. If you have a normal destination you normally go to, if you don't hear back from it in some timeout, or you get an error message back from that destination, you have a failover destination. You go and you send the same request there. What could be simpler, right? Well, it gets a little more complex. For different kinds of pools, we have different kinds of failover. For a replicated pool, you know you have that same data right nearby you. 
If you can't send a replica B, well, you can send a replica A or C or D, and you can get the same data. So that, that works pretty well. If you're in a sharded pool, though, you don't necessarily have another copy of the data right nearby. So McRouter will know that this is a sharded pool. I don't have another copy of the data. What it can do is it can send it to a neighboring cluster. So you saw in Harrison's presentation, we have a bunch of regions, each which has multiple clusters. Inside of those clusters, we'll have memcache pools that are often indeed actually replicas of each other, but sort of at the next higher level. So McRouter is intelligent enough to know for this data, I can go to either a local replica or I have to go to a replica in another cluster. Another complexity that comes up with failures is transient failures. Not only can things fail, but they can come back. <laughs> and that's almost worse, right? Because when, when a memcache box comes back, is you, you suddenly might be reading data that's stale because nothing was going there, not your deletes, not your sets, everything's out of date. So what do we do about this? The solution that we've come up with is to replay deletes for consistency. If you recall back to that standard model of memcache I talked about, that is one which relies on deletes for consistency. Whenever you miss, you go and you read the data from the backing store or recalculate it again, right? And so if we do, if we do deletes, we'll end up in a state where we miss again, and then we can come back and grab that data out of the database or whatever. So that works really well for us. So McRouter knows how to spool up deletes that, that were supposed to go to a certain destination, and if that destination ever happens to come back online again, we can replay them back to that destination, then we end up in a, in a good state again. All right, so there's also, I was telling you about the multiple clusters, right? And if each cluster can have a copy of the data, when, in, when that piece of data is changed, we have to delete the copies from all of the memcache clusters, right? So McRouter has, a, has the ability to broadcast deletes to all clusters. Fairly straightforward, we simply send the delete to, to all the possible places it could go, it, it could exist, and then we know that we've gotten that delete to everywhere. And again, this can actually be a multi-McRouter a multi stage process. So we could have one McRouter that is sending it to other McRouters, because again, a McRouter just looks like a memcached box, right? So you can put another McRouter in there, and then you get not only failover at the, at the level of the, maybe the regional McRouter talking to a cluster lo local McRouter, but if a box inside of the cluster fails, you also get the next level of, of failure and replay of, of deletes. Another problem that we'll run into in, in practice a lot is we have to do some maintenance. And so we end up with a bunch of empty cache servers. So maybe we do some maintenance or there's a sev and we, a bunch of boxes are reset. So what do we do about that? When they come up, we have a solution called cold cache warmup. What this is, is we'll do the get to the regular pool, the cold pool we call it, and if we get a miss, we can send that same get to a warm pool. It could be in another cluster, for example. And then if we get that data back, we will add that data back to the cold pool. Now, those of you who are familiar with the memcache protocol will notice I didn't use the term set. Add is a conditional set that only sets the data if it's not already there. Um, here at Facebook, we use delete hold offs inside of memcached to basically say, to avoid races between the, the data possibly being just deleted and then being reset from the, from the warm pool. So, this is where we started out. All of the responsibilities were on the client side, which meant that really only one of the clients had all of the goodness that we, that we had for Memcache, and that was PHP. What we've done with McRouter is moved a lot of this complexity into this McRouter layer, into this middleware, and so the clients can become much simpler, but you still, for all the clients you have, get all of the goodness of all the distributed system stuff that you want. There's a couple of interfaces I want to talk about. Um, I've been talking as if uh, everything's a standalone McRouter. In practice, we actually see a lot of things that use memcache that want very low latency access. And going off of process, even to a, a McRouter that is on your local host, adds some latency. So we also, generally, most of our clients that we use actually have an embedded McRouter. So it can be embedded as a library or it can be standalone. So the standalone version is what we'll use for like propagating deletes. But if you're just a client that wants to do very fast gets, you'll often have an embedded McRouter. So going back to what we want, we want something that's as simple as a single memcached instance, but a server never fails, network never flaps, has limitless memory, infinite read throughput, and uniform low latency to whoever's talking to it. And so what we've built is McRouter. Um, it's simple to use. It implements failover to hide network and server failures. It shards across many servers, so you have tons and tons of memory to read from. Replicates for high read rates. It reads from local servers, but broadcasts to remote servers, so it's low latency to anybody reading. 
And it's been proven at scale. We today do over 4 billion operations per second through MicRouter at peak, and it's used for both the memcache and the tau workloads here at Facebook. So in conclusion, MicRouter unifies the distributed systems client-side logic for both memcache and tau. It supports any, any client that can speak the memcache protocol. So if you have something that already knows how to speak to memcache D, you can stick MicRouter in there and it will start working for you. It's embeddable for low latency applications like HHVM or any client that wants to read at very low latency, and it's been proven at massive scale. So I'd like to open up for any questions that you guys may have. Um, so you talk about uh, dealing with the transient failures. Um, that's some. That's the part I like. I didn't quite understand very well. Um, so let's say you have a consistent hash rate, and then one server died, and then are you suggesting that you would just remember the position of that server in that consistent hash rate, and then like uh, persist all the uh, you know sort of key manipulation? somewhere, and then when that guy come back, like it gets added back to exactly where it was before, um, and like replay all the deletions? The, the general thing that will happen here is we'll actually remember the, the host name, that not the host name, but the IP address of, of the failed server. And we don't immediately swap, because we know that it might just be a network hiccup. Like if we just can't send something for a couple of minutes, probably the, the server will come back up, and it'll have most of the data we want. You know, we have, we have gigabytes of memory uh, in these things, and we don't just want to throw it away if there's a good chance that we can get most of it back, right? And so what we'll do is we'll be queuing up deletes that would have gone to the server while it's down. If we decide to swap it out, then we can actually throw away all of, all of those deletes. But if we bring it, if it comes back up, if the network comes back, whatever, whatever caused it to be down, then those deletes will be replayed. So that, that's the way it generally tends to work. And I was trying to find this again, but I, I missed it somewhere. Uh, so the question was, is there a setting that of how long a server can be in the transient failure mode? And the answer is no. The way this is actually works is there's a separate system. Um, I think we've talked about it called FBAR, Facebook Auto Remediation. It decides when to swap a box out if it's, if it's sort of given it enough time to try to come back. And McRouter knows that once a box is no longer in McRouter's config, then I won't have to talk to that box anymore. I can flush these deletes that were queued up for it. Uh, so, uh, so do you... Um do you worry about the uh, slab allocator? You, by your scale and your use case, you've got a very heterogeneous uh, use case coming at you. Do you worry about the slab allocator implications of different size objects getting into your lowest level memcache Ds? Um, so worry about it, you mean in terms of what? It, d does it become an operational efficiency problem? Well, Do you so just let them be badly sharded? Do you so, so both uh, open MP. source and internally here at Facebook, our memcache Ds now deal with, uh, I think generally it's called slab Calcification, we internally have always called it slab ghettoization, which I think is a great term. Um, but yeah, so, so that's actually a solved problem now. We rebalance between slabs and, it, and um, it's, not, it's not an issue. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, is that, is that in the uh, public memcache it, it now is, I believe, I believe that is also in the public memcache D and we've also solved it internally. What about MC router, are you uh, publishing uh, that open? Uh, MC router, we would like to. Our plan was actually to open source it at this, but we're not ready to do that yet. There's still a lot of things. Where, like, it won't even compile outside of our environment today, so uh, you probably don't want it right now, but uh, we would like to get that open sourced, yes. Uh, how about the uh, deletes? Are they right through, or is it cache invalidate, or how, how do you? Um, so memcache D is a look aside cache, right? So it, it doesn't know anything. Again, it will never send a request on its own. It only responds to requests. So it's not read through or write through or anything like this. Everything is taken care of. Like the consistency model is done outside of memcache D proper. It just accepts deletes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I had a rather simple question. What programming language was it written in? Uh, McRouter is written in primarily originally C, and it's mostly been migrated to C++ at this point. Hi, I wondered if like um, 
like there are requests when you have to actually contact a large number of cache servers and sort of collate the data, like do a multi, uh, do a get on maybe lots of keys, which go to lots of servers. If you have actually uh, faced any kind of problems in that kind of workload on memcache, like because of maybe one server being slow on the memcache side or at the client side, any network related issues? So all of the aggregations we might do are not handled inside of uh, McRouter, like data type aggregations. Those would all be handled inside of the client today. Um, the cases where we have to contact the most number of memcached servers are generally on the delete pathways. For example, the delete to a replicated pool, if you have many replicas, you may be sending out many deletes, especially considering it may have that many replicas in each of your clusters and so on, right? And so we actually rely on a tree, basically a, we call it the fabric of McRouters, the McRouter fabric, where we send a delete to one of them, it gets replicated to um, the cluster level McRouters, which then send it to each memcached inside each cluster. Uh, one more follow-up question uh, regarding the replication. Like, uh, like, what kind of replication factor do you have generally for your uh, memcache pools? Like, does it vary from application to application? It, it, it varies because? very highly. So the standard ones are just sharded. We don't have replicas. Um, we have some which have a single replica, and then we have some which are very highly replicated because the data read rate is so high. How, how often do you like push updates to the MacRouter's config? Uh, as often as something changes in, in, I don't know where you were, but um, there you are. Okay, as often as something changes. So whenever a box dies, we'll, uh, we'll swap in a new box and then we'll push out a new, a new config. It used to be that we did this globally, um, but, but with the introduction of the McGrouter fabric, we only have to update ones that are local to the cluster where the box has died. So that, that ended up being a lot better for us. So like, how do you like push one config change? Like, let's say you're gonna deploy a new code at Facebook and you swap one server, like doesn't one fleet think I need to talk to server A, another fleet thinks I need to talk server B, there's inconsistencies during the deploy phases. So yeah, there's a couple of ways we deal with this. One is we have a config system that is uh, consistent within 10 seconds, that works really well, but we've also been working on um, additional functionality inside MicRouter that we call migration functionality, which is we'll send deletes to both the old and the new destination for a time, but wait long enough to make sure that everybody's synced up on the same config, then we can start sending uh, gets from, instead of going to the old one, they'll go to the new one, and you know, so everybody will start talking to the new one, but deletes will go to all places so we maintain consistency throughout the migration. Uh, I have a question regarding the pools of man caches that you have. Um, do you have built-in mechanism in Mac router, or you rely on the developer to use the right pool when it comes to the cost function that determines the data? It's honestly a bit of a mix. So McRouter relies on the, what the, the key looks like, but we have also options to override that. In general, um, it's still the client that's choosing what pool it goes to ultimately by choosing the prefix of the key, um, but it's pretty easy to change the prefix of a key. It's just string concatenation, right? So um, that's, that's generally how we do it today. Uh, since you allow embedding the uh, McRouter client, uh, what, what happens in that case if you like queued up the deletes and Maybe I shut down my service and. That, uh, so that, yes, that. Um, the there, there's a there's another s subsystem called McReplay actually that is responsible for making sure these things get replayed at some point in the future. It will rely either on um, a standalone McRouter on the same box or be able to play them back directly itself. Um, so we don't actually need your particular thing to be persistent in order for that to work. What uh, McRouter knows how to do is to queue things up in the right format for McReplay to be able to play them back. So question here. So regarding your earlier comment of moving from C to C++, although I can guess the answer, can you just share your experiences and your motivator, motivation behind it? So I think honestly, originally it was simply because the people who were working on McRouter were more familiar and, and very fond of C. So the original authors, um, we kind of had a, you know, things move pretty quickly here, and a bunch of people came in that really liked uh, C++ and particularly C++ 11, and they said, hey, let's, let's make this a lot nicer. And there's definitely, um, I would say that the things that have bitten us a lot historically with, with the system are things like ref counting, and C++ makes that a lot easier. You don't have to deal with those things manually anymore. Um, so that's been really nice. Uh, having some higher level constructs has been really nice. We've We've really heavily used like Folly, Facebook's open source library, now that we've moved over to C++ as well. So there's definitely a lot of good things that have come out of it. Um, particularly, 
one thing that I didn't really go into too much detail here, but you saw that one slide where we were composing multiple of these types of problems we were solving. Um, the way we do this is something internally called route handles, and um, they basically are a really nice thing that would be difficult to build in C, but it can exist basically because of the nice features of C++. Okay, thanks for sharing. So when you update the config, when you update the config, do you have to restart the process, the standalone process? Uh, no, no, process? It, is, it, is, it knows how to update itself. It has a separate thread actually to parse the config and then swap it in. So it happens while it's running. Um, you never have to restart the process for a new config. And if the process does die for some reason, do you like immediately see database reads, or what's the strategy? Um, uh, for McRouter, since it's embedded, it can't die without your like web server dying. So uh, that works pretty well. Um, if the if the local McRouter dies, uh, gener generally um, systems are smart enough to kind of throw up their arms and not overload the database. Uh, but it, it you know because this is not a read through system, a poorly formed client or a malicious client could of course go and overload your system, but it could do that without McRouter too, right? So. Uh, you were talking about the cold cache uh, situation, so it goes to a cache and gets a miss, goes to another cache, finds it, and goes ahead and proactively tries to you know, put it into the other cache. At what point does it determine that a cache is no longer cold and doesn't just, you know, uh, McRouter currently does not make that determination itself. That is defined by a configuration parameter. So we will tell McRouter, you're currently warming up this pool or this cluster. And it will do that until we tell it to not do it anymore. So we have our own sort you of. You manually t tell it to stop. Yeah, we, we manually tell it to start and stop. Um, but it's basically just a, a switch we flip in a, in a site configuration variable, right? So I think we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much.